This is Twit. You may have seen this on National Geographic, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the BBC. If you watch a lot of German TV, who doesn't? All the you time. Might, <laughs> A huge story. Joining us via Skype, Professor Thomas Garrison from Ithaca College. He's an archaeologist and, and I want this title, a National Geographic Explorer. Do you, get a, cool. do you get a special hat with that? You know, I got to admit, uh, I didn't know I was a National Geographic Explorer <laughs> and I saw, until I saw that in the article. It's uh, official. <laughs> well, I, I've, uh, I've received some generous grants from them in the past, uh, but I didn't know that you held that title for life. I thought it was just uh, oh, yeah. while you had the oh, money yeah. from them. So, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to bear it and, and very proud to have uh, the association with that organization. It's kind of like being a, a member of the Explorers Club in the, in <laughs> yes, the 19th yes. century, right? You, just, <laughs> you should at least get a special pith helmet, I think. You know, so, I think I have a little lapel pin I'm supposed to wear at conferences. Okay. Right. Pith helmet. I'm just, I'm just saying. Get the pith helmet. Uh, so, you, you, tell us about archaeology. Did you? Did you? Was this something? I feel like this was something I loved as a kid. Did was were, was that how you got into this, Thomas? For sure. And you know, that, uh, that's what most people tell me when I, I meet them. You know, they say, "Oh, I, I always wanted to do that." Yeah. And I say, oh well. I did. Um, and yeah, uh, I, certainly, uh, I fell in love with it as a as a kid. Um, I actually grew up in a house that was built in 1720 outside of Boston, and in my mom's garden, I used to find old nails and mm -hmm. horsehair wow. plaster and yep. collect them. Those square uh, nails, because that's all the blacksmiths could do. I, I yep. grew up in Providence in a house built in 1806. Sure. Same yeah, thing. It, old bottles. Exactly, exactly. And then... Um, then when I was in college, I, I did a, a study abroad experience down to Mexico and then uh, went straight to do my first field work in Belize. And when I came back from that seven month trip, I was pretty much sold on archaeology as a career and specifically on, on studying the, the Maya. I remember reading the story of Hiram Bingham and Machu Picchu. Of course, he was the explorer in the 1900s, early 1900s, who found Machu Picchu, even though everybody knew about it all along, mm -hmm. but he was the first white guy to find it. Right. Uh, but but at the time, and I and the, watched the movie. Did you see the movie The Lost City of Z? At no. that time period, people knew there was stuff in the jungle, but they just really there was it was so hard to get to, so hard yeah. to find. The Inca Trail is is overgrown in many areas. So this is an interesting idea to use technology to look beneath the canopy and into the jungle. Yeah, um, you know, this is, uh, we call it remote sensing technology as sort of an umbrella term. And uh, when I started in graduate school, um, I began collaborating with a couple of guys at NASA at the Marshall Sp wow. Space and Flight Center. Uh, NASA actually had a staff archeologist at the time, this guy, Tom Seaver, who, who was a, a great mentor to me. And, uh, we started trying to find discolorations in in the trees using sort of infrared combinations of, of different color satellite images to see if we could find um, vegetation changes where Maya ruins grew. Oh, interesting. And, and we, it, it worked okay. So uh, we would trek around and some days we'd get somewhere and find something cool and some days we'd trek all day and find nothing. So, um, you know, the, I think one of the things that people think when they see this uh, technology uh, to find ruins, they think it's these guys sitting around in, in a lab and from afar trying to find these places. But the reality is that the, the people that are most obsessed with this are the people that have spent their lives slogging around that terrain and just desperately want something to give them a little guidance and make it a little easier for us. Are there, do you think there are a lot of ruins that are undiscovered that are just hidden? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, the, the ancient Maya are in southern Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, Belize, Honduras. But the, the real heart of that civilization is in northern Guatemala, where the country's done a very good uh, job of creating the Maya Biosphere Reserve, which actually preserves the largest stretch of, of jungle in that part of Central America. And so uh, more than any other country in that area, I think we have the most ruins to discover in northern Guatemala. Hmm. 
Now, does this sort of technology make it easier on actually, you know, going and finding where to dig? Does this make the process faster for you guys? Does it make it so that, you know, maybe you could just jump in and, and do your work for a couple weeks versus maybe months? Like, I'm very curious how much of a time saver and a money saver this might this sort of technology might be. Well, it's a it's a money saver and and time saver in the sense that we no longer have to uh, spend our time mapping. So, mm -hmm. uh, where I work, uh, the site of El Zotes, which is uh, just west of the image that you're showing there, um, we spent uh, about eight years uh, of our field seasons trying to do a really detailed map of that city. And in that combined time, let's say going about a, a month a year, so eight months of work. We probably did about, um, you know, three quarters of a square mile or something like that, and that probably cost us over a hundred thousand dollars over the the time that we did it. And lidar, you know, one flight and you get uh, so much more than that, and it does it better than we do. Amazing. So it, lidar is very very humbling to uh, those of us that try to try to document these ruins because it it just does it so quickly. So to answer your question. Um, yeah, it, it reveals everything to us, which lets us start to uh, ask new questions and approach the archaeology in a new way. What it doesn't make easier is, you know, you still got to walk out there and and get to the place. Just because you can see it right. doesn't mean there's oh, doesn't yeah. mean there's a road to it. So, um, yeah, it, it's just that we have more direction, and we know at the end of every day we're gonna find something. Wow, I mean, this is an example of the jungle you have to cut through, and this is an example. Tell me how, of how the LiDAR sees it. Tell me how LiDAR works. There's a plane flying over. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a sensor that's mounted onto a, a plane, and it's a laser technology. It stands for light detection and ranging. There you go. And uh, it's connected to some base stations and also to, to GPS satellites, so you get very accurate readings. And as it shoots its uh, laser beams down, every time one of the lasers meets a point of resistance, it gives you a, a 3D coordinate. So uh, in the end, you get this big point cloud, much as you would if you were doing some sort of uh, laser scanning or something now uh, of an object or, or something like that. And so um, what you can do then is pass all that data through a computer and the computer will determine what the lowest point in a sequence is. Basically, what is the point that reached the ground? Mm. And you might say, well, it's the jungle. How does it get to the ground? The density of the points that are shot per second is so great that some of them are going to get through those tiny, tiny holes in the leaves. Wow. But in the end, we throw out you know, 95% of this data uh, and just keep the ones that get to the ground. And that's what lets us create these uh, amazing images of what's underneath. So it's not x-ray, you're not seeing through the canopy, you're actually just yeah. managing to peek through a little tiny gap yeah. in the leaves it's, and the trees. It's pure brute force of laser technology. Wow. Uh, it's uh, some of them eventually sneaking to, through. So yeah, it's billions and billions of points. Now, how big is the area that you're scanning? Yeah. Well, that's what's really special about uh, this particular project. Um, LIDAR has been done in the Maya area before, which is how we got the idea for it. But when we approached uh, the Pakunam Foundation, this, this uh, group of philanthropists in Guatemala, uh, we said, hey, this would make a really big impact here in this country. And they, they went all in and they said, well, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it big. And so this survey is 2,100 square kilometers, Holy which cow. is more than double the uh, largest survey that had been, on, been done previously for this, for, for archeology. span So uh, that was really what, what was the game changer was not just seeing these sites that we kind of knew about, but seeing all the spaces in between, and then also seeing these broad trends um, across the region as a whole. How old are these ruins you're seeing? Well, that's uh you know it's a good question because they're definitely ancient maya but what we're talking about is you know almost three thousand years of yeah. history compressed into these images so yeah. we're seeing the totality of that ancient occupation so one of the things that's going to be our jobs moving forward is how are we going to sort out you know what was occupied first mm. what was occupied at the height of it and what was occupied 
in, in later periods. But most of it probably dates to what we call the Maya Classic period, which is about uh, AD 250 to 900. It's so amazing to see these images. Did you know that these things were there? So um, some of the images that you're looking at there, you know, where you see those uh, big, big uh, complexes, you know, th those are places that we, we knew about. And the images that we've been showing, a lot of them are, are highlighting places where we're actively doing excavations. Right. And by we, I mean this large consortium of multiple archaeological projects that have somehow managed to uh, collaborate and get together on this and start talking with one another. So that's another uh, great thing about this. Um, yeah, and so there's a, a mix in here of things that we did sort of know about and then expanding outward going into the unknown. And, you know, that's what's really exciting. And of course, the most interesting stuff is always right on the very, very edge of the data where, where you want to see more. Yeah, of course it is. But it's an amazing thing that the, the government of Guatemala, that the Pakenham Foundation, uh, that these disparate archaeological groups are all cooperating to map this 2,100-kilometer uh, area. That's got to be unprecedented. Yeah, and, I, you know, I think it's because, um, you know, the foundation in terms of its goals and the Guatemalan government in terms of its goals see the benefit of this, um, not just because it's really cool for us archaeologists, but uh, when you're talking about Guatemala, you know, your archaeological tourism, that that's big industry oh, down yeah. there. You know, yeah. when you get off the, you get off the plane, uh, every beer ad you see has got a pyramid in it, you know? And so um, this is a way to sort of catalog the cultural resources that they have mm -hmm. and let them know sort of what they're, what they're dealing with because looting is still a, a rampant yeah. problem. You know, we're saying we discovered all this stuff uh, using this technology, but the fact is, uh, when we look at it really closely, we can actually see the damage done by looters. Oh, wow. um, so, new to us, but not not new to some people. Yeah, when we were at, we were in Machu Picchu last year, and uh, second time there, it's an amazing thing in Peru. And the Peruvian government clearly knows this is a massive uh, benefit to them. In fact, unfortunately. Uh, the amount of tourism in Machu Picchu has kind of gotten out of control. Yeah. There's a lot of yes. people. It's happening that, all over. And, I, and do you worry a little bit that discovering these will kind of make them suddenly subject to uh, overrun mm -hmm. by tourists? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I think the, the best example of that in the Maya world would probably be uh, Chichen Itza, Chichen, Chichen which is, uh, yeah. you know, receives all that traffic from Cancun. Yep. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, the, you know, these buildings pyramids and things like that weren't built for millions of people to traipse over. They were pretty exclusive uh, structures. And, you know, the, the Mexican government has basically prohibited people from climbing on these structures and left the big open spaces for, for people to walk around and, and observe them. I think one of the reasons people like to go to Guatemala um, is because the ruins are you know, they're sort of feral. They're still yeah. in yeah. that in that jungle environment. Yeah. And people like the idea of the, the mysterious Maya, this lost yes. civilization. And, uh, you know, we just want to be clear that um, they're still very mysterious. They're just mysterious in a new way to us. Um, uh, we still have to go to the field and, and do all this stuff. And there, there's still a ton of stuff we don't know. In fact, it's almost like we're looking at them for the first time again. So... Uh, everyone should should not get too worried. There's still kind of a, a, a confusing uh, civilization that we need to research and understand. You can also do an augmented reality walk through this. You could. Uh, I think National yeah. Geographic yeah. has uh, has an AR video of this. Yeah, yeah. So you know, uh, all of this that you're you're seeing right now is, is part of a, a promotion for. Uh, a documentary that will be airing on the National Geographic channel uh, on February 6th, 9 p.m. Eastern. Oh, that's so uh, oh, good. That's going to highlight, it's going to highlight a lot of this work and also um, some of the actual on-the-ground archaeology. It sort of combines the, the things that we dig up and uh, the, this broader project that, that a bunch of us have been working on. And so, I, you know, I think it's going to be uh, really entertaining and, and hopefully bring good positive exposure to the Maya, none of this uh, ancient alien stuff. <laughs>
Well, I mean, ancient, you know, it's... Uh... <laughs> but who was that, that guy who wrote all those books yeah. about... Yeah, the, yeah, that's kind of Oh, sad. yeah, about yeah. Danikin. Yeah, Chariot yeah. of the Gods. Yeah, yeah, Chariot of the Gods, that's it. Are there other um, archaeological digs around the world that are using this sort of technology? I'm really curious if this is, like, an up-and-coming thing that's being used in the archaeological community to help just find other parts of the world. I'm, I imagine, what about, like, using this in Antarctica to see, yeah. you know, how the glaciers are doing well it, it's funny you mentioned that that's one of the other uh major lidar projects of the the outfit out of the university of houston that did ours they did a lot of lidar down there in antarctica for exactly that purpose yeah uh, the the best archaeology example of this has actually been at angkor wat uh in cambodia where they've been mm. doing it for for quite a while uh that's kind of the the model that got us thinking about this in the maya area um, I think that the next frontier is probably going to be to do the, the Amazon because with deforestation in the early 2000s, they started seeing these earthworks of some, you know, lost group that we didn't Clear really know existed. Brush. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> someone was mentioning Lost City of Z. Yeah. Uh, you, you wonder, you know, that's sort of the, the last great frontier. Um, so LIDAR is used... Um, you know, they did it over Stonehenge. They've mm -hmm. done it on the Tara Plain in Ireland. They've done it to look at colonial New England stuff. But it really has its its greatest impact in these areas where it's really hard to get around and see things. The jungle has swallowed it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is so cool. I, you've got a great uh, job, uh, Thomas. I know you, you've been kind of stuck at home. Are you going to go back this summer and uh, spend some more time? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, this is usually uh, about the time of year where I start to get the itch uh, <laughs> to go back. Um, you know, it's pretty grueling work. You, uh, you know, you got your, your bug bites and your heat yeah. and everything you got to deal with. And by the end of one of the seasons, you're, you're kind of tired and exhausted. But you, you go through this annual cycle. And, yeah. uh, you know, back here, I, I lived in uh, Los Angeles the last five years. And I just moved back to the Northeast. And I'm experiencing this icy winter oh my God. yeah it's because it's freezing <laughs> yeah so i am uh you know I'm, I'm watching the video you're putting up there and and thinking about being Jungle. back down there yeah thomas such a pleasure to talk to you and what an exciting project uh this is so february 6th is the national geographic special uh what's yes. it what's it going to be called so we can find it it is called lost treasures of the snake king which I think uh, maybe do? doesn't the sound much. <laughs> Lost? Yeah. yeah. Search for Snake King. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know what? Some, I think NASA learned this, that if you're going to popularize this hard science, you've got to make it accessible and fun. And National yeah. Geographic obviously knows that as well. Um, yeah, but we, we definitely feel that responsibility. We want people to know that the real science is exciting and it yeah. doesn't have to be uh, sensationalized uh, beyond what we're actually not, doing. It does not have yeah. to be charity of the gods. It's still pretty darn interesting. Wow, I can't wait. Well, I look forward to going down to Guatemala on my next uh, on my next Come see expedition. Us. Yeah, I'd love to see it. Uh, thank you, Thomas Garrison. He's a professor at the uh, Ithi Ithaca College. He studies archaeology, National Geographic Explorer, and one of the people who helped map the Guatemalan forest using. LIDAR. Thank you, Professor Garrison. Appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thanks.